Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's hard to quiet down people after the 2015 elections that were so exciting, and here we're finally at the next morning. Um, I'm John Weingart. I'm associate director of the Eagleton Institute of Politics, and I'm delighted to welcome so many of you, welcome you all here and see so many people. There's an overflow room over there. If it gets too crowded where you're sitting, you're welcome to go there. And this, uh, the, uh, this event is being live streamed, and it's available both in this building and anywhere else online. It's also being uh, filmed and will be on the uh, Eagleton Institute's YouTube channel, so you can watch this many times over the next weeks and months. Um, we have a, uh, a distinguished panel to talk about what happened in yesterday's elections and, uh, and their implication, the implications of those results, and, and uh, perhaps we'll stray into talking about the 2016 and 2017 uh, races as well. A um, couple of announcements. If you uh, have a cell phone, please turn it off or silence it. Um, because the event is being um, filmed and recorded, um, in particular because of that, when we get to questions and answers, we'll ask that you raise your hand and um, I call on you, please give your name and, uh, and where you are from. Uh, there are a number of students here. Um, uh, some of them are here because, or in part because they're getting extra credit and there are forms in the, uh, in the foyer that you can get after the question and answer session for, for the students. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone who's here, and, and in particularly Governor, former Governor Jim Florio, former Assemblywoman Greta Kiernan, and I believe former Assemblywoman Barbara Wright is here as well, or coming here to be here. Um, since we've had these events the morning after each uh, primary and uh, general election since the spring of 2000, except we didn't do it this past spring because there just wasn't, there was even less happening on the ballot in the primaries for this year than it turned out to be the case for the general election. Um, but now we're back on track and we will have these regularly, but it does bring the, raise the question of what an off-year election is about, why we have them, what their implications are, and those are some of the questions we'll get into as we go through the program this morning. Uh, but just to dramatize, I think, what, what it means in, to take one race that we will be talking about during the course of the morning, the 11th legislative district in New Jersey, where the two assembly women were defeated, the two Republican assembly women were defeated by Democratic challengers yesterday. Um, the Democratic challengers, two years ago, in uh, 2013, the Democrats running in that race um, got uh, 19,000 votes, over 19,000 votes, almost 20,000 votes. Yesterday they got 13,000 votes. When they had 19,000 votes, they lost. When they had 13,000 votes, they won. So that's the difference that turnout makes. And you know, there are numbers like that that we can talk about for um, multiple districts in the state. One other point I want to mention before we get started uh, with the panel is that uh, yesterday's uh, election was a very good election for the Eagleton Institute of Politics. Uh, one of our current uh, graduate fellows, Jonathan Castaneda, was elected to the school board in West New York. Uh, coming in, there were three candidates out of, there were seven candidates running, and three were selected, and he was one of the, the top three finishers. Um, in Burlington County, um, an Eagleton alum, Ryan Peters, uh, was an Eagleton fellow in 2012, and was elected uh, Two Republicans defeated two Democratic incumbents to, uh, for the Burlington County Board of Freeholders, making that board an all-Republican board. Um, so Ryan Peters will be one of the new freeholders. And that's particularly poignant to those of us at Eagleton because he was a, uh, as all Eagleton fellows up through 2012 were, was a student of Alan, the late Alan Rosenthal. And he was, um, I think the last uh, teacher's pet that Alan adopted <laughs> and uh, nurtured his, politi his political aspirations, I think, before he knew he had political aspirations. So um, 
he, Brian Peters, will be a freeholder from Burlington County. And uh, one other fellow, uh, Peter Yeager, who was an Eagleton fellow in 1992, was reelected to the, the council in East Windsor. There may be others, but those are the ones I know of at the moment. Um, so I want to welcome our panel and ask them to uh, give their impressions of what, what happened uh, uh, in the election yesterday and what it means. Matt Friedman is a reporter for uh, the, the New Jersey Bureau of Politico. Um, Gail Gordon is a attorney with Florio Perucci, Steinhardt and Fader. And I just have to point out that means my boss is sitting in the front row. So That's true. Please, be kind. <laughs> and is a uh, Republican fundraiser. Julie Roginski is a Democratic political consultant and a Fox News contributor. And all of them have been on this panel in, in the past and in, in for one, one or more uh, election cycles. And here for the first time is Jonathan Salant, who is the Washington correspondent for the New Jersey Advanced Media and the Star-Ledger. He's been a reporter for a long time, from going back to 1987, I think, but is reasonably new to specifically covering New Jersey politics. So, Matt, what happened yesterday? What was interesting to you? Uh, the first point is that so far it does look like yesterday set the record for lowest turnout for a general election in state history. Uh, we still need to crunch the final numbers, but I think we're talking about 21 percent, which is actually lower than the October 2013 special election for U.S. Senate, which was held on a Wednesday in October. So that it was ridiculously low turnout. It's the first time the assembly has been the top race on the ballot since um, uh, 1999. Uh, but for me, the, the real biggest lesson we learned was, yes, it was obviously a good night for Democrats. They took three, possibly four assembly seats. It was a rebuke to Governor Christie, uh, no matter what he says about Alan Rosenthal on the <laughs> district map. Uh, but the biggest thing here was that it shows you the shifting campaign finance landscape. Money does matter a lot. And a Democratic super PAC came in and spent more than a third of pretty much all the spending on this election and won it for the Democrats, essentially. I mean, that's not to take away from the campaign efforts, but the su there's just one super PAC funded primarily by the New Jersey Education Association and some labor unions with connections uh, to the Norcross family. Um, absolutely dominated spending in this race. And it shows you where we are right now in the campaign finance landscape. Political parties themselves are less and less relevant, while these um, you know, so-called independent groups are getting more and more important. It's not the most outside spending we've seen in a New Jersey election. That was 2013. But it was the largest uh, proportion. Uh, and you know, we're still totaling the numbers. We won't know for, for a few more weeks exactly how much was spent. So, so for me, the big takeaway in there is just the power of uh, so-called independent spending and super PACs and how they're playing now, not just at the federal level, but at, but at the state level as well. Jonathan, what was your take on it? We'll come back. Well, it reminds, the election reminded me of that old anti-Vietnam War poster, uh, but modifying, what if they held an election and nobody came? Well, we mm -hmm. saw what happened. And the, you know, off-year elections are turnout elections. You get your people to the polls, even if it's 13,000 votes, 6,000 votes less than you got last time, and the other people don't, you win. And uh, off-year elections for you know, people entrenched in power, people who have connections. We mentioned the super PAC. They obviously had a large, lot of money to get their people out to the polls. And you know, the teachers union probably made sure a lot of that, made sure all their educators showed up, made sure their allies showed up. And I tell you, win elections. Okay. Yeah. Um, I can save you a whole lot of money with your polling and, and tell you that if I give money to a candidate, that candidate is certain to lose. Um, <laughs> last night, uh, with the exception of Assemblywoman Holly Shapizzi, uh in the 39th District, all my candidates lost, including um, in Park Ridge in Bergen County and in Glen Rock in Bergen County, which is ironic because it was my husband who was Senator Bob Gordon's ticket. So uh, last night we had some uh, heated words when we both got home from our uh, respective and, and divergent political headquarters. Um, I must say from a personal standpoint, I am a very good friend of Mary Pat Angelini's who uh, lost with Carolyn Casagrande um, in the 11th district. And I think the 11th and the 38th, which is Central Bergen, uh, tend to be very competitive districts and they were outspent three to one, despite having some, some very good fundraisers. 
And I will uh, end by saying I'm also um, co-chair for Governor Bush's campaign, so don't give him any money mm -hmm. either. We'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk a little about that, but one of the things that I wanted to talk about a little later um, is the difference between super PAC money for a candidate and hard dollars and what you can spend that money on. Uh, because a lot of people are saying, at least in Governor Bush's case, and, and I wouldn't totally count him out, you know, he's got $100 million in super PAC money. Well, that's really not going to do you all that much good because you can't spend that money on staff, travel, um, low-cost advertising. So I would like to get into that a little later as well. Thanks. Julie? Uh, well, Matt alluded to it, I think, earlier, but with all due respect to Governor Christie's uh, battles against Professor Rosenthal's map, you did see a massive rebuke to Governor Christie yesterday, and the reason for that is because places like District 16, District 11, which have been created with a map that has been enforced for a couple of cycles now, seem to have gone Democratic. District 11 is certainly Monmouth County, but um, District 16, I think Andrew Swiffer is up by about 25 to 30 votes um, at the current moment, and you're talking about fact that Somerset County, which is a traditionally Republican county, had an incredibly robust turnout, whereas South Brunswick, which is a Democratic county, had nobody in the ballot, they were in Princeton, which had you know, not a really competitive election, turned out. And the reason for that is only Republicans in New Jersey are finally being able to vote and so have the independents in the as well, which is what Governor Christie and Harvey calls around their necks. take lessons from what they saw yesterday, which is that if he's not going to be standing up for them, they should not walk in lockstep for him to their own detriment. So if I were the governor this morning, as Matt said, he could spin it however he wants it. Massive rebuke to him and to his leadership over the last several years. I also want to acknowledge that uh, Brendan Gilfield from Essex County I think has, has joined us as well. Um, so what does all this, what do these results mean for governing in Trenton over the next year or two in terms of the, the issues, the Transportation Trust Fund and all the other pensions and the other issues that have been being batted around in Trenton. Does this change the dynamic of how they're going to be addressed? Well, I think one of the things you have to look at, the person who's having the worst morning this morning is John Bramnick. And if John Bramnick, um, it's no surprise he obviously wants to run for governor. And I think this has been a crush to his fundraising and his ambitions. Yeah, I, look, I, I think what you're seeing now, and I, I would hope that John Bramnick, for the sake of his own caucus, sees this, and certainly his members see this. They need to chart their own course. Um, there has been a reluctance, and it's a mystery to me as to why, um, other than just pure fear, um, to stand up to this governor on issues that they had originally supported like the gun, like the assault weapons, or not the assault weapons ban, excuse me, like gun control legislation, where Republicans overwhelmingly voted, voted for it, the governor decides to veto it, and then they stand with the governor, makes absolutely no sense to me because ultimately they look fec uh, feckless, and at the same time they also look like people that don't, aren't able to stand up to a guy who's incredibly unpopular in New Jersey. And so if they are smart and they're doing what's best for their own careers and not just what's best for this governor and for his presidential ambitions, which are pretty much petering out by the minute, uh, as Patrick Murray, who I think is here, could, could tell us, um, they will understand that this state is not Iowa, that they have to understand that this state has views and issues that they need to address for the sake of their own constituents. It's why you see somebody like, again, Mary Pat Angelini and Caroline Casagrande, both of whom I happen to like on a personal level a lot, but they lost in large part because voters rebuked the fact that they couldn't stand up to this governor. So if they're smart in the next two years, they're gonna make sure the Republicans that are still there, and there are not as many left, 
that they chart their own course. Yeah, I just to, to add to what Julie said, although the governor's presidential prospects have been dimming, we have a poll this morning that's actually a pretty significant bright spot that showed him going from 2% to 8% in New Hampshire. And I wouldn't read too much into one poll. If that's followed by more polls, then we're going to have to start talking about him seriously competing in New Hampshire and maybe not being completely dead. But, but the thing is, it's kind of a pattern with this governor. As his star has risen nationally, the party at home, the, the governor didn't build the Republican Party in New Jersey, and we're seeing that now. It's all been run on the force of his personality. A lot, you had Republicans in New Jersey who had their own sort of personalities popping up. You had Jay Weber, who was a sort of charismatic state chairman early in Christie's term, and uh, he started, you know, having kind of a mind of his own, and suddenly he wasn't state chairman anymore. Uh, and so we haven't, we never saw the governor really build the nuts and bolts of the Republican Party at home. While his own ambitions soared, uh, look what they're left with now. So. Democrats now have the biggest majority, I think, since they since like 1979, uh, while our governor is running for president. So there's a real disconnect between Christie's prospects and, and the Republicans' prospects. We're going into a governor's race, and I know we're going to talk about this soon, where Republicans don't have a bench. So. Well, for, for these, do we have something? Yeah, just one thing with the Republicans in the Assembly and in the Senate when you don't vote to override is everything's happening in New Jersey is being seen on a national stage. And even if you're a member of the Assembly Republicans and you voted yes on the bill and the governor vetoes it and you vote against the governor, now it's going to be seen as a national rebuke to Governor Christie. And some of the Assemblymen don't want to rebuke the governor who's running, wanting to run for president, run for president on, on a national stage and be, it be seen at that. Not that you're doing something good for your constituents, not that you're setting up your beliefs, but you're rebuking the governor of your own party who's running for president. And I think that's coloring a lot of what these people are doing. The other thing about the, Matt mentioned one of the governors, one of the polls, but the Quinnipiac poll out today is even more significant for Governor Christie because it shows that him and Hillary Clinton are likely two people running that people really appreciate their leadership. It shows that Governor Christie is in positive territory and favorable, unfavorable, and for a long time he was not. So there's a lot of good news for the governor in that poll as well that maybe he is doing a little bit of breaking through. And remember, it's still early, as Mayor, as, I mean, as President Rudy Giuliani can attest to, it's still very early. Yeah. Well, why, though, if, if um, I mean, Republicans in the legislature have been comfortable not endorsing Christie's campaign, not contributing to it, why are they then, um, as you suggest, um, being deferential, perhaps, in, in voting against their own views on some of the veto override? This is a really powerful governorship. Mm -hmm. And this is a governor that can hold up appointments. This is a governor that can hold up contracts for their respective firms or whatever else their financial interests are in. And I'm not suggesting there are any nefarious pecuniary interests that they have. But, you know, this is the most powerful governorship in the country. And so the governor has a lot of power, not just in the sense of being able to pass or sign legislation, but in the sense of being able to effectuate a lot of other aspects of their lives. Having said that, there are certain members of the legislature who did not endorse this governor, endorsed Jeb Bush, for example, and still yet march in lockstep for the most part with this governor voting against legislation that they had originally either, either sponsored or legislation they had originally supported. At some point, the voters are going to wake up, and I, I would submit to you that they woke up yesterday and realized that whatever the interests of these legislators are, they're not in the interest of their own constituents, they're in the service of what's best for this governor and his financial, excuse me, his political ambitions. And uh, again, that's something that I think, uh, to their own detriment, is something they're going to continue doing because two years from now, we have a much higher turnout election that votes better for Democrats. I don't see a Republican on the ballot who's going to win the governorship uh, in large part because, as Matt pointed out, this governor has pretty much destroyed the Republican Party and the Republican brand. Um, and I'm not saying this to be partisan because I, it's just basic math. I mean, there's nobody out there. It's John Bramnick. John Bramnick has done everything in lockstep with his governor, and the governor got rebuked yesterday, and you saw that, and you see what his numbers are in polling um, day in and day out. So they should pretty much, if I were in their shoes, as I said, I would chart my own course and not be so fearful of what this governor can do to them on aspects and issues that they're not, that's not legislative, but personal. Well, if an assembly woman or assemblyman Republican Party votes 
for or to over or to, 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 to me back up doesn't give to Governor Christie. That's a story for Matt Friedman in Politico, New Jersey, when they vote to override the governor and he gets embarrassed. That's a story for Mike Allen at the main Politico, and that's basically the difference. And we already had the Senate vote to override the governor on a bill that had passed without opposition that had Republican sponsors, including in the Assembly, John Bramnick. And now that's going to go back to the Assembly in December, and they'll see if they can override it. It wouldn't have been such a big deal uh, if the governor hadn't demanded such lockstep um, of his troops. It, it, would have, it wouldn't have been a, seen as a rebuke to the governor if, it, if he had allowed it to happen before. But we've seen it, you know, about like 52 times before it happened. Uh, well, not every single one of those times, many of those times Republicans who had voted for a bill, you know, in a lot of cases sponsored or co-sponsored bills, all of a sudden after the governor vetoes it, the Christie administration is a font of knowledge and there were things that they didn't realize when they wrote the bill. Uh, so I just think that the governor's own maybe, maybe a bit of an overreach there to, to have such strict party line enforcement kind of, you know, when ultimately they're going to have to look, the, the senators are going to have to look out, out for their own interests and that's going to backfire you on you more. But, but, but the thing is, now it moves on to the assembly. And when we talk about how powerful the governorship is, he has a lot more leverage against senators than he does with assembly people. I mean, senators don't have appointments. Uh, assembly people don't have appointments to hold up like senators do. Uh, so so it's, it's probably an even, even heavier lift for him to avoid this uh, veto override in the assembly next month. I, I think another person who's having a bad morning uh, is Senator Jennifer Beck in the 11th district, who happens to be a good friend of, of both Julie's and mine. And she is very capable of um, going against Christie, yes. um, very liberally, excuse the expression. And I, I think we also can't forget that there is a lieutenant governor who is a woman and who is a Republican and who I think is very interested and is, has started her own PAC um, and is going to run for governor. Uh, Kim Guadano, and I have said to her, you can't run fast enough away from Chris Christie. And I think another thing, Matt, that, that Republicans are finding out more and more is uh, because he's, he exercises so much control and really nothing is happening in the governor's office right now. You don't get return phone calls, and they're not going to return my phone call anyway. But um, <laughs> So very little is happening there. So I think Republicans are saying, why am I bothering? You know, and I think in, in Jennifer Beck's case, you're going to see some very dramatic things from her. But John, I hope so. But John Beck's a very good example of somebody who didn't vote to override this veto, uh, which is which is that was a bizarre. A, a didn't need her. It it, it it doesn't matter. That is a huge mystery to me as to why Jennifer Beck, who should have shown independence from this governor on an issue that overwhelmingly people in her district support, didn't join Joe Carrillo's and didn't join. Um, Connors. Um, Connors and didn't join Pitt um, Bateman. Pitt Bateman. And, did, you know, for a bill that she voted for originally. And that's the problem for Jen Beck, who I, as, as you said, is a friend and I happen to like. But, um, I know, agree. That was strange. It was strange. And, again, that's something that these legislators need to really take a second look at. Why not? What is Chris Christie going to do to Jen Beck? And, and you know, it was, it was yeah. especially strange with Jen Beck because she was a co-sponsor of yeah. that bill. She voted for it the first time. And she voted for the override the first time Democrats attempted it. Yeah. Um, so then to go back, it, it, she was in a very strange position to go back and change her vote on the override, and she was left hanging because some, I, I, did she think it was going to, to fail? Because it seems very odd that a Republican would actually switch her vote for no purpose uh, when actually the override went through. So uh, it, it, she does have a lot to worry about in 2017 with what we just saw happen to the assembly members in District 11. And while the governor is never in, or at least very rarely in a legislative race, the main issue, he was a liability for Republican candidates. Uh, I, I don't think he can deny that when the Republican candidates were putting out mail themselves saying we stood up to Governor Christie. Uh, so he was a liability, period. And now Jen Beck is going to have to deal with that in, tw in 2017. But the, two years ago, the numbers I gave out at the beginning, but the, two years ago, the assembly women in that district carried one by 10,000 votes each. Yeah. So if the same electorate turns out in two years that turned out two years ago, they or whoever the party nominates, I would think, has a good shot. But and don't forget, 10 years ago, I was doing mail in certain Democratic districts saying, how well we all work with Governor Christie. Right. Uh, right. His numbers are incredibly good. And then 
Bridgegate happened, Sandy recovery happened, a lot of other things happened, and his numbers aren't so good anymore. Look, it's going to be a tough district to hold because it's obviously not a, it's a swing district. Um, but you can't compare Chris Christie's popularity when he was the top of the ticket two years ago with what we saw yesterday and what we're going to continue to see. Um, I will defer to the, to the pollsters in the room about where the trend is going, but I, I don't see how he turns this around, especially as he continues to spend more and more time pandering um, to the Republican base vote, which is not reflective of New Jersey at all, not even reflective of New Jersey Republicans. This is a reflective New Jersey, this is what's reflective of New Jersey Republicans. And I'm a dinosaur. Yeah, and, yeah. and I mean, not, not you know, what, what I hear him yeah. say on, on Fox News or any other place where he happens to appear. So what happens for governing for the next six months or two years? Um, at a minimum, we need to have a state budget. We have a former state treasurer with us today, but not, the, not a, uh, I guess we have an, a, a nominee for a new one. Um, but do you see uh, a way in which the Democratic legislature and the governor move forward on, on just the routine maintenance of government as well as uh, addressing any of the problems and issues we've got? I don't think I can underscore enough for the folks in the room. And I've worked for a governor uh, closely, a good one. And I work now with a former one that was a good one. There is an amazing amount of just gridlock in that governor's office. I mean, from the top, you know, the lights are out at five o'clock to the various departments where there are unfilled positions or acting heads. Um, I'm, I, I think you're going to see a rather activist uh, state senate but I'm not sure what can get done, John. I'm really I, not. I feel like there has to be action on the TTF. I mean, it's going to run out of money on the Transportation Trust right. Fund. It's, it's going to run out of money in July. And there will have to be some sort of face-saving measure so the governor can sign a tax increase while claiming there's revenue neutrality. But there has to be something because the only thing worse for the governor's presidential aspirations than signing a tax increase is if a bridge collapses and people die because we weren't maintaining it. I mean, that's really, <laughs> that would be a big problem. But um, uh, ultimately, for the big issues, no, we're not getting anywhere on pensions because as the governor runs right, the Senate president is running left. So the governor's running for president and the Senate president is running for governor. There's no incentive for either of them uh, to make any sort of real deal on pensions, which is a huge issue and which is going to come to a head someday. I, the governor's plan is not going to be enacted anytime soon, but it is unsustainable. And eventually, a couple years down the road, there's going to have to be a day of reckoning. I, I think that's pretty clear. Um, but it's not happening when you have you know, people with political incentives to go in completely opposite political directions. The first term, you know, Christie's first term, let's come together and, and get things done, that was a long time ago. And his second term has been completely the opposite. So um, I do see, I, I can't imagine something not happening on the Transportation Trust Fund. But other than that, I see a very hard time getting anything substantial done over the next couple of years. But also, let's look at the timeline, right? I was in January, New Hampshire's in February. Let's assume that Christie's not going to win either. And then we go to Nevada, South Carolina, Florida. He's not going to win any of those. And then Super Tuesday. Hypothetically, he's out by early February. The budget's due, what, in March, Matt? Um, uh, yeah. Well, yeah. right, but his, his oh, submission right. of the budget, his, right. Yeah. So, you know, the question is, does he come back to New Jersey with the intent to govern? Does he come back to New Jersey, question one. Question one. Does, secondly, does he come back to New Jersey to govern, or does he come back to New Jersey to say, well, I didn't do so well this time around, maybe I'll try again in four to eight years? Mm -hmm. A lot of that is very, well, but it's possible. A lot of that is very, and, and that's the answer to the question of whether anything right. gets done. Right. Can he raise the gas tax? We need to raise the gas tax. I think everybody agrees from an economic standpoint, there's, there's no other way to do it. As Matt said, we have bridges that are about to collapse and he can't continue to read the Port Authority for money to fix the Pulaski Skyway again. Um, so the question for him is, what does he intend to do? What kind of governor does he intend to be? I am pessimistic that he will come back and do what's right for the state. I think he will continue to do what's right for him and for his own career. Um, and that's where the problem lies. I mean, you don't have any leadership in Trenton right now in the front office, and that's incredibly problematic. You have a governor in the front row. I don't want to embarrass Governor Florio by being effusive about him, but she made some very tough decisions that were politically unpopular. And to, I think one of the bravest decisions ever that set the course really for the state to be in the shape, in good shape. 
vast difference between what Governor Florio did and what this governor does. And that's the problem for the state of New Jersey, unfortunately. I want to open this up to questions and comments um, in just a moment, but let's talk a little about the, the, um, the governor's race in two years we'll, um, and, and skip the presidential race, at least for the moment. Um, so you've mentioned a couple of potential candidates or non-candidates of uh, Bramnick and Jay Weber, and, um, and there are names that have been sort of batted around over the last couple of months, uh, mostly by the people who have those names. Um, but are there, what are your thoughts about where the governor's race is at this ridiculously early moment to be talking about it? I think that the w conventional wisdom, and, and but that's not to denigrate it, because I think it's at this point in time pretty accurate, is that Democrats are heavily favored uh, to win in 2017 after after eight years of Christie um, and in a traditionally uh, democratic state uh, and a Republican party that, whose infrastructure has not been built up, uh, it, it's almost a sure bet uh, right now, according to you know, almost everyone who's giving you an honest assessment that a Democrat will win in 2017. It's, but it, it is two years away, so I don't want to get too, you know, too certain about that. Well, we'll discover that the national conventions next year will be anything but national for New Jersey, unless Christie, of course, is on the ticket, because that's a place where both parties will, candidates will be making contacts. Remember, the most politically active people will be in Cleveland and Philadelphia, and they'll be holding receptions, they'll be making contacts. Uh, wouldn't be surprised to see a lot of reception a night for one of the potential gubernatorial candidates, and we'll have a good handle a year from now who's going to really be and who's really going to be out. Comments from others, questions? The only way the Republicans have a shot, um, and I'm, I'm personally very fond of, of Lieutenant Governor Guadano, is if a John Crowley mm -hmm. uh, or a, a businessman of, of note decides to run, mm -hmm. and that's, I think, a long shot. And have a self-funded campaign, basically. If there is such a thing. Right, right. Yeah. right. Uh, wait, wait for a microphone and then please identify your, who, you, who you are and where you're from. Beth, Hi Beth. Beth Heyer from Morristown, New Jersey. I'm involved with the League of Women Voters of the Morristown area at the state level. Uh, and I was just wondering, um, where do you think Steve Fulop fits into all of this? Um, I'm just interested to see what that pattern looks like. Uh, particularly, and, I, and I'll just add this real quick, um, in light of all of the um, events that happened this week with prisoner reentry, and the fact that the person in the state of New Jersey who started that whole impetus, former Governor McGreevy, was nowhere to be found or mentioned, and he's closely aligned with, with uh, Mayor Fulop, so I was just wondering if you see any connections there. I I'm going to do Julie a favor here. <laughs> <laughs> Julie uh, works for Phil Murphy, who's a, who's a likely Fulop rival. Um, you know, for a lot of the time I've been hearing that Fulop was really the front runner for 2017. Um, he heavily supported a ballot question in Jersey City last night about moving the elections to November, which, although it's seen as a potential fallback so he could run for the Democratic nomination for governor and um, and you know, if, if he loses that return as Jersey City mayor, to his credit, he's been pushing it since like 2010. Now, whether he's been thinking he's going to run for governor since 20, 2010 is another issue. But he's got the Jersey City Democratic machine behind him. But this only passed with some opposition from a former corporation council who worked for Fulop's predecessor. It only passed 53 to 47, I think, or 52 to 48, something along that margin. That's not exactly the type of strong number you need when you're supposed to have, you know, the real the Hudson County Democratic machine behind you. Um, that was a pretty narrow win. I mean, a win is a win, but it was pretty narrow, and uh, I think a lot more narrow than people expected. So it doesn't exactly show off his strength a, at this point as a, uh, as a potential gubernatorial candidate. I thought I did see something about McGreevy at the, uh, at the Obama thing. I know he wasn't quite front and center, so, so I'm not sure about that, that aspect of it. If you notice, um, the president came to New York, right? He did not go to Jersey City. So um, I think that tells you something about where 
their head was. But I'll leave it at that because as Matt said, I'm, I'm a little conflicted here. So. Well, a lot of that, I think, you know, Cory Booker has been a leader in the Senate on criminal justice. He's made that his signature issue since being elected. And he was former mayor in Newark. And Booker's name was on all the criminal justice bills. Remember, Booker supported Obama in 2008 when everybody else in the state was supporting Hillary Clinton on the Democratic side. So I think it's more that they were talking about Cory Booker more than Steve Phillip on that. And, and let me just add to that, um, Senator Booker is actually a former client, and he's been talking about um, criminal justice reform in a very bipartisan way um, with Rand Paul, of all people, going back to the minute he got elected. I think it was the first thing he, one of the first things, and, and Brendan Gill, who's a, a former uh, current freeholder, excuse me, would probably know better than I would because he still works with Senator Booker. But um, uh, this is really a, a passion project for, for Senator Booker, and, and he's nationally known on it, so I think that's really what that was more about than, than Mayor Fulop or, or Governor McGreevy or anybody else. Before we leave the, the 2015 election completely, let me, uh, this, this, we take, Eagleton Institute, we take the Eagleton Fellows to Maryland every year to compare Maryland government and New Jersey government, and, and, um, and one of the ways in which it's different is in Maryland, they elect their entire legislature and their governor to the same four-year term. So two year, last year they did that, and, they're, and as they say when we meet with them, they're, they're basically stuck with each other for four years, and they think of it as having three years to govern and one year to run for re-election. Um, and I've yet, uh, I, it, it seems to me like that, that would be a better way, however you would get there, I mean, amending the Constitution and everything, for New Jersey to operate, and I wonder what your thoughts are. if, if um, you divided assembly districts, so each Senate district was composed of two assembly districts, and you had an you know, assembly person represented half the area, but still got a four-year term. Um, we wouldn't have an election like yesterday where 20 percent of the registered voters, you know, where we're, we're interpreting the results where an assembly, one candidate is ahead by 19 votes when 20 percent of the voters voted. You know, you know. Well, I live in Maryland, so I can <laughs> speak to that. Personally, uh, and in a sense with Maryland, what happens if the governor is, first of all, you have a bigger turnout, obviously, because it's not an election in an off year that nobody's ever thought about. But you also, then, if the governor has coattails, he can bring people in and then they owe him, and he has a, a big working majority. Case this time around, the Democrats controlled everything, in the, and a Republican governor was elected. And a few years ago, when that happened, the entire legislature and the governor went became at war with each other beginning in January. This time around, Governor Hogan, who's a good friend of Governor Christie, and in fact, is raising money for him, reached out uh, with a you know, olive branch, and so far the Democrats in the legislature have not cut it off. <laughs> well, there are lots of varieties of that. In Pennsylvania, yeah. where I'm from, the Senate, there are super big Senate districts, and smaller, they're called representatives there. Or the equivalent of our assembly people, and the senators have six-year terms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a modification of that. But but they elect their judges too in Pennsylvania. So does anyone know the results of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court? Too? There were three Supreme Court justices. Yeah, okay. I don't. We can find that out. But governor, go to me. You need a mic, but you don't have to identify yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Just uh, make two observations that are counterintuitive. One is that generally in low turnout elections, Republicans prevail. They have more discipline than Democrats do. So it was a little strange to have the lowest uh, election, Republicans not doing very well. And secondly, just on the question of money, again, traditionally, Republicans raise more money, particularly out of the super PACs, on a national basis as well. And then I'm surprised that the Republican Party didn't utilize its skill in those areas to get out of state money. I mean, the governor last year was spending, raising money for everybody around the whole nation in substantial amounts. And this time, virtually no money came in from out of state. So I think that's somewhat questionable. There's something working, and it may very well be what you're talking about, the governor's influence in the, in the election being negative. Uh, yeah, I think, Governor, um, what Governor Christie's doing is using every last, trying to, as he says, what is it, squeezing the juice, juice from the orange. Juice from the orange or juice from the lemon, whatever it is, but um, for himself. I mean, he's having trouble fundraising for his own presidential ambitions. The last thing he wants to or cares about doing is raising money to the Republican State Committee 
unless it's to pay for his legal bills on Bridgegate. So, <coughs> excuse me. So um, the problem, it's true. So the problem, again, I think for him, and it's not even that. I mean, what I was astounded by, and, and Gail can speak to this as well, um, you have the Bergen County Republican chairman, the largest county in the state, who has never vetted any of his candidates. Or if he had, he wouldn't have had the disaster he had in District 38, where he had a candidate who wrote a book, apparently, that had all sorts of racist things in it. And they claimed he never bothered to read it. So that's how much the party is out of control. I mean, there's no, there's nobody vetting candidates. There's no infrastructure. There's no money being raised. Um, I can't even tell you who the Republican state chair is right now because I that person Sam just, Rea. Yeah, that person's been so much, and he was hired, I guess, to, or not hired, but he was there to to raise money. But I think even he's having problems raising money. They're, because they're there's half no, a million dollars in debt. Right, right because now. the problem is that the person, and, and you know this when you were governor, I'm sure that you were the main fundraiser for the Democratic State Committee in the sense that the governor always brings in money. This governor is not interested in helping these guys out. He's interested in running ads in New Hampshire for himself so he can go from 3% to 6% and consider that, a huge, vic down. Uh, consider that a huge victory. Right. What Julie's talking about is the 38th district, as I said earlier. Um, my husband is the state senator there. There's a candidate named Anthony Coppola, who's a River Edge Council person um, who wrote as a as a young man granted a a, a tome uh, a self-published book um, and on, on the back of it was one of his rejection letters and he, he published it on the back of his own book and it said the worst filth I've ever read sincerely Putnam you know I mean it was outrageous so he did try to buy up every copy of this book but somehow the opposition research had it for, for quite a while. And then just to put a little further icing on this, he was a clown. I mean, that was his profession. He was a clown. <laughs> so, I mean, he ran an amusement company, you know, for kids' parties. And it's probably one of those scary clowns. But I, text, I texted Julie when he resigned. I said, clown down. No. So, yeah. anyway. But to her point, which is a good one, Bob Uden has been uh, chairman of the Republicans as long as I've lived here, so that's at least a decade. Um, and his own wife lost in a council race in Wyckoff last evening. And he is not vetted properly. And I think one of the problems is not, not Bob Uden per se, but the county chairman's job has become an old person's job. And the person who wants these jobs in a lot of these counties are folks who are retired and have the time, and so this is what happens. And I think it's a real shame. I can't imagine, I can't think of one, yes, uh, the guy in Somerset, Al Gabora, Al Gabora. Is, a, is a young guy. But other than that, they all look pretty much alike. <laughs> one of the things going on, though, well, we're nationalizing a lot of our state and local elections, but at, what was at stake uh, last night? No control, no redistricting, so if I'm the National Republican State Legislative Committee, which Ed Gillespie, a uh, former White House aide, ran, I'm not going to put my money in New Jersey. I'm putting my money in Virginia. State, uh, the stake of the uh, control of the state Senate was at stake. So there wasn't really anything nationally to worry about Jersey, except if you wanted to embarrass Chris Christie a little bit for running for president. If he was a front runner, maybe they would have put a lot, the Democrats would have put a lot of money in outside. Republicans might have propped them up, but Right now, why spend the money in New Jersey? You can spend it and get a bigger bang for the buck in Kentucky, where you won the gubernatorial election, and Mississippi, where you reelected a Republican governor, and in uh, Virginia, where you kept control of the state Senate. But I guess the point is, you have Democrats who've raised an awful lot of money into these super PACs, um, Democrats who had a stake in the outcome of these elections. Um, you could have had a governor who did the same. I mean, you could, he, he's the governor. I mean, people forget, but uh, you, you have somebody who's got the ability to raise money into super PACs more than anybody else in the state by virtue of the office he holds, and yet he did nothing. And not only did he do nothing, but the people that were actually implementing the mechanics of the campaigns, the county chairs. I mean, you had John Bramnick, somebody told me, who was going on a bus tour, right? Is that right, Matt? Yeah. The, the yeah. weekend before the election, and, and had wrapped the bus. That cost, I don't know, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 to do. You could have put that in District 16. My God, they could have held on to Donna Simon if he had spent that kind of money in District 16. Well, see, she might. She might, she might still, but yeah. the point is, you know, it shouldn't be. Um, so the reason I say that is, you know, these little vanity projects that they do for themselves, uh, nobody understands. What the Democrats have gotten very good at, and we weren't very good at it for a long time, but I, I truly believe in the last few cycles, is the mechanics and the science of campaigning, whether it's targeting or modeling or, or, or these very sort of Obama-esque 
um, niche things that I think a lot of us learn from the Obama campaign from 2008 and 2012, we've now imported into local elections, into assembly and state senate elections. Um, and the Republicans are still doing these, but they're, they're just not, uh, mechanically, I, I don't get the sense they're doing exactly what we, sh we are doing on our level. They need to go back to campaign school and forget how to do it. Yeah, that. I mean, they were caught completely yeah. flat-footed in terms of fundraising mm -hmm. the selection cycle. I mean, they were outspent, you know, upwards, in some places 10 to 1, in some places that were supposed to be competitive. I mean, not only did Democrats outraise them, but then this super PAC came in and just, like, put a whole other, you know, layer of dirt on top of the Republicans. But, so it's, but it's not even that. It's not even the money. What we do, I'll give you a good example, Middlesex County, which is a Democratic county, but still has towns um, here that are Republican. We took the modeling structure that Obama used to win Cuyahoga County in Ohio in 2008, um, which really won him the election to some extent, 2012, excuse me, and imported that into places like Milltown and Middlesex Borough. I mean, these towns with, you know, five and a half people in them. But that's what you essentially do to win these elections. And it's, it's, it's such a micro thing to do, but it really professionalizes the tenor of local elections. I think you don't see that as much um, being done. I know you had the other side. It's not, it's not a money issue. It's a matter of the mechanics of campaigns and having professionals do stuff that they do on the national level that they can import on the local level. Well, it is a matter that's of money, though, because if you're Sam Rea and you've got to write checks for Bridgegate debt, you're not going to be able to right. send your operatives you know, to campaign school to learn how to target and to exactly. micro-target. And that, I mean, it's really, you know, I haven't written a check to the Republican Party yet this year because I don't want my money to go for that. Well, one you know, of the things, remember, uh, Governor Christie as a federal candidate is, was restricted on how much he could raise for a super PAC under federal law. One of the reasons Jeb Bush entered the race much later is he could, when he, before he was a candidate, could raise a lot of money for the super PACs that are $100 million. Then he went to the race and he couldn't raise that type of money anymore. So Governor Christie, even if he wanted to, could not be raising a lot of money for super PACs uh, because of the f federal restrictions, because he's a federal candidate. I'm sure his good friend Bill Palatucci doesn't have that restriction, right? So he can do whatever he'd like. <laughs> mm -hmm. But Jonathan, your, your earlier point, though, I, th I think if, you, if, if you're a national, look, looking at this from a, the National Democratic or Republican Party, the National Republican Party ought to be happier with yesterday's results nationally than the Democrats. And I mean, the re coming at a time when there have been so much, uh, so many descriptions of the Republican Party being in chaos with the, the election to succeed Boehner as speaker and, and the, the multiple candidates in the presidential primaries, that you, in the midst of that climate, Kentucky switches from a Democratic to a Republican governor who did not sound like an exemplary candidate, and and as you say, in Virginia, where there was a really intense effort to switch the state senate from Republican to Democrat, that failed. Well, as Tip O'Neill said, all politics is local, and on a race like this, while you're putting some money in, you can't it's hard to nationalize an off-year election, especially low turnout and specific races. But in Kentucky, they hate President Obama, mm -hmm. uh, and the uh, you know they hate. Uh, Obamacare, even though Connect, their Obamacare is a huge success. Uh, Miss, you know, Mississippi has gone south. The whole south, the whole south, has gone Republican uh, in the last 40 or 50 years. And Kentucky is a border state, and they're the trend also. I mean, they have, they, Al Gore used to be the senator from Tennessee, and Tennessee is all, all Republicans. Uh, Will, uh, you know, Wendell Ford used to be the senator from Kentucky. It's all Republicans now. This is just a continuation of a trend we've seen. Yeah, and at the same time, I think you know. 15 years ago, Republicans, you know, there was a Republican mayor of New York City. Um, it seems like, you know, Republicans used to, be, just as Democrats are having a harder time in the South, Republicans are having a harder time uh, in traditionally blue states. Uh, we're getting more polarized, but, I, I, you know, Kentucky, I know, is traditionally at the state government level Democratic, but it's not a blue state. Um, so, so I don't see that as a huge, as, as signifying anything for Republicans nationally. In yeah. fact, I think demographically and based on the tenor of the debates we're seeing in the Republican primary, it seems every four years we hear Republicans talk about how are we going to appeal to the Hispanic vote. Um, you know, we really need to win the Hispanic vote. And although they have two, you know, Hispanic candidates, either of whom has a, a good shot of being the Republican nominee, you have a primary where, you know, your front runner right now is using very inflammatory language about Mexicans, and everyone's talking about, well, who can build the bigger wall on the southern border? 
And, and that's a, you know, that is a, this is a structural problem with the party, which is where you have to appeal to the, you know, so far right to the base in the primary, and then you have to find a way to backtrack in the general election. Uh, and, and with the shifting demographics in this country, uh, it's really going to continue to present a big problem for them. And, and I don't think Democrats have that kind of demographic challenge. Yeah, that, I think it's a really good point. And the other point to make on that is you've got, um, remember Reince Priebus, the chairman of the RNC, commissioned this post-mortem after mm -hmm. the 2012 election, what went wrong, what do we do, we have to be more inclusive, we have to have debates where we're not just talking to each other. Um, it can't be a echo chamber. Flash forward three years down the road and they are disenfranchising Latino voters in ways that I, I can't believe for their own sake. Um, they're having a debate about debates where they now want people who only voted in Republican primaries to be able to moderate debates. Um, okay. Uh, um, they just got rid of Telemundo, who was one of the sponsors of the debate, the only opportunity they had to, to talk directly to a Latino audience, um, and so on and so forth. And as, as Matt pointed out, and, and demographically and structurally, to get to the electoral votes they need to get to, they're already behind. So. Um, these, these walls that they put up for themselves structurally are, are insane to me. I don't understand. I mean, I, I understand because I, I understand where they're all coming from. But, um, but it's very short-sighted. The RNC was short-sighted in doing that post-mortem, releasing it publicly, and then not understanding that the, after they let the horse out of the barn, um, Ryan's Priebus looks kind of powerless on this. So, uh, you know, as, as Matt pointed out, it's going to be a tough haul for them going into 20, 2016 with that kind of rhetoric. Jean Fox, retired public servant. Uh, issues. A lot of people are concerned about issues. Uh, the Republican Party in New Jersey used to be the Rockefeller, Kane, Whitman Republican Party. Uh, it's my party, too. Governor Whitman wrote a really good book about that. Uh, Chris Christie is the first conservative Republican uh, elected statewide in New Jersey. How do issues play into that for us in the state? And why are our Republican friends, who have been moderate for a long, long time, not living by their principles? Or even the members of Congress who are Republican, most of them were re moderate Republicans when they were in Trenton, they've done 80 degrees to, as well. So how do issues play into that, and why do politics turn people around on issues? Some of it, I think, is, I don't want to say peer pressure, but the Republican Party is moving much more conservative, and the Democrat Party is moving much more liberal. There are no Charlie Stenholms in the Democratic House anymore. There are no Heath Schulers in the Democratic House. At the same time, I mean, all you have to look at is New Jersey. Marge Rockamore was replaced by Scott Garrett. That tells you everything you need to know about the state of both parties. And also, when you get to Washington, and Tom DeLay, known as the Hammer, he was the majority leader until he was indicted, uh, he forced people to vote the party line. I still believe that many moderates retired from Congress because they were tired of having to f take votes they didn't want to take. Uh, Newt Gingrich, when he was speaker, let them vote their conscience, and they, when he left, they were told, I believe they were told, uh, that you needed to vote this way, and th th that there was a report done, the president's impeachment, when they impeached Bill Clinton, where Tom DeLay could bring the Peter Kings of the world and the Jack Quinns of the world and other moderates and say, look, if you don't vote this way, there are 50% Republicans in your district who will vote you out in a primary. And with these, the districts today, most people are worried about losing a primary, either if you're a Democrat to a more liberal candidate because they're motivated to vote, or if you're a Republican to lose to a more conservative candidate because they're motivated to vote. I mean, even a uh, you know, the guy from Utah, whose name escapes me, the senator who lost. Uh, uh, and then you have Dick Luger, I mean, who loses a primary because he's too willing to work and pass something. And uh, even Marco Rubio, who signed on with Bob Menendez, signed on to the immigration bill. He's renounced it, but he's still being attacked as a rhino. And Marco Rubio is nobody's uh, picture of a moderate Republican. Look, look at what's going on um, with our own governor, right? He said he got into politics back in 1994, whenever he first ran, because he wanted to preserve the strongest gun laws in the country pro-assault weapons ban, and that's the reason he got into politics. I think that's virtually a direct quote. He used to be very pro-choice. He used to donate to Planned Parenthood, he and his wife. Mm -hmm. um, 
he, uh, as, as, as a former John Corzine staffer, very happy to hear he reappointed um, John Corzine's Chief Justice to the Supreme Court. So said that he defunded Planned Parenthood not because of any um, ideological reasons, but because we didn't have money in the budget. And then lo and behold, a presidential race comes about, and all of a sudden he can't be more anti-gun control, can't be more anti-choice, can't, you know, and so on and so forth. And the reason I say that is because there are really no issues, Jeannie. I wish there were, but, but, it's, but it's all about politics, and it's all about getting elected. What I was shocked about is, if you remember back in 2009, in the lame duck session, marriage equality came up for a vote. The governor walked into the Republican caucus before he was, a, before he was the governor and instructed all of them to vote against it. And there were several Republicans who were going to vote for it because uh, they wanted to vote for it, made it very clear to them that there was no vote of conscience that he would ever undertake, and they all had to vote against it, and only one, one, his name was Bill Baroni, voted for it. Um, everybody else voted against it. And that set the precedent and set the template for the fact that there are no votes of conscience. There are no issue-based votes anymore. There's punishment if you don't toe the party line. There's political ambition on his end but there's absolutely no issue-based discernment as to whether you should vote one way or the other. And I think that's troubling if you're an actual constituent of the state and you actually want people to vote based on their conscience and vote based on what's good for their constituents. But more and more, at least under this, I know I'm being very negative on him, but it's gotten to the point where six years later, it's enough already. Somebody's got to stand up to him on issues they believe in. And um, I'm hopeful, again, I'm hopeful that these Republicans will learn the lessons of what they saw yesterday and start voting their conscience and stop voting out of fear. I have to, I have to say, it's a, it, he's incredibly politically gifted. Um, sometimes the tide turns against you, but he's the most talented politician this state has seen in decades. Um, no offense, Governor. But it, <laughs> 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 um, so uh, what's amazing to me is in 2013, he has this landslide victory does not do much to help the Republicans down ballot and they don't net a single seat in either house. And yet he still keeps them in line uh, for almost two years after that before any of them even, even think about rebuking him. I think that's a testament to his amazing political skill. But I think when we talk about him as a conservative, I, I won't name the reporter who said this to me, but it was a, one of the best reporters who's I think ever covered politics in New Jersey. Uh, it was, you know, shortly after Christie got elected and, and he was being called a conservative. He said, you know, Christie's not a conservative. Christie doesn't belong to the Republican Party. Chris Christie belongs to the Chris Christie Party. And, and I think if you look at Christie's record over the years and, and where he was politically, that, that has a lot, of, um, a lot of validity. And, I mean, we talk about him being pro-choice, and you look at his story uh, about how he turned uh, pro-life was, uh, I think it was, you know, seeing his daughter... Um, uh, you know, uh, seeing his daughter's heartbeat when, when his wife was, was pregnant with her. And then you go back and you look at the actual time and you look at a Morris County freeholder meeting after his daughter was born, where he's on the record in a newspaper saying, well, well I'm pro-choice, but uh, he, I, he was voting in favor of a non-binding resolution for a partial birth abortion ban. And, and he was saying, well, I'm pro-choice, but I think this is even going too far. And that was after his daughter was born. So even that story doesn't really add up totally. Uh, I think he said later in like 2009 that he was misquoted, but I think there are two newspaper accounts with it. Uh, I, I it's should all, probably it's also not his that. first child, so presumably right. he, 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 he'd seen yeah. the heartbeat of the son before he saw the heartbeat of his daughter. Right. But, yeah. I think that's a good point, though, because um, talk about Christie getting a bump in the polls, which I think was very predictable. He had a very good debate um, last week, is that the national media hasn't really been scrutinizing him. And I think if he, if he bumps up into the... The, really the, the middle of the first tier, they're going to get some really good Chris Christie stories. You should write some of them. Yeah, and I, well, <laughs> Well, let's also not forget, um, and I hate to be the Grim Reaper, there is a trial coming up right. in the next six months. Which um, is after Super Tuesday. Which though, is after Super Tuesday, but for some reason, if he survives past Super Tuesday, uh, you know, there is a Well, hold on. Idea. We don't know what's going to happen with the other part of that, the United part right, of that right. case. And the David Sampson part, which I think, um, as a as a not casual observer, is actually the more interesting part of the story. I mean, because you have you have a governor who took down a, a CEO of a, a Fortune 500 company 
just unbelievable. And I also have to say, too, we're talking about the Republicans and Marco and Jeb and how everybody's flawed. I just have to say, I, I think the Democrat, the presumed Democrat frontrunner has some pretty big problems as well. Um, I de uh, Ruth Mandela, I just want to add in at this moment, and people on the panel know because I ran up there before to ask them about this. So just for the room, for those of you who, I don't know how many of you here are um, MSNBC watchers, um, Fox but News. he is about to have a national moment, which is going to be fascinating, following up on what you just said, Matt, that is his gifts are on display in a video that has been seen in the last 24 hours, I think, by a couple of million people, uh, shown in its entirety last night by Rachel Maddow, shown this morning on MSNBC on Morning Joe. It is him at his best as a storyteller. And in fact, he talks about how pro-life he is from birth to death. And what he's talking about is addiction and tells two stories, one about his mother and one about a law school friend. And it, I've watched him in this room with students, and he is a very, very gifted storyteller and political connector in the kind of room that he was in when he told these stories, I think yesterday, I'm not sure when. Uh, but it has had a remarkable pickup, and I'm just putting it in here because it may last three days, the bump may come and go, uh, you know, it doesn't contradict anything that you've been saying, but I don't think his moment in the national presidential spotlight is over yet. The only thing I will say is if it plays well on MSNBC, I can assure you it's not going to play well with Republican primary voters, and those are the people that he needs to um, appeal to. And so, um, and I said to yeah. Julie, if MSNBC has two million watchers, they'd be thrilled. Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I can put in a shameless plug for one of my pieces I wrote when the governor announced how he could be the nominee, and a couple of things we talked about have come true. In the sense, you've got to do well in the debates; that plays to his strength. The the town hall meetings that plays to his strength, and New Hampshire and to a lesser extent Iowa is a really the retail politics state. And you basically have to do well enough and hope the other guys fall. And although the respect, Gail, the fact that Governor Bush is having problems now is a boon for Christie. The fact that Scott Walker pulled out is a boon for Christie. The fact that John Kasich, who initially had a bump and now in the last two polls is tied with Christie, is a boon for Christie. I'm not saying he's going to win, but certainly he, if he's standing and he remains standing, he can be a, a decent candidate be certainly be a viable and make a credible run as the primaries begin. Again, you know. All I was saying is if I were a reporter and Chris Christie uh, gets a big bump in the polls, I would have a ball with some of <laughs> yep. these stories. I, I have to say to um, anybody see the Marco Rubio video where he gets out of a car and a reporter's following him and asks him if he's Superman or Batman and what music he listens that. to. West I Coast sent it to John. West, West Coast rap. Yeah. 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 Oh, no, he is. He's no, it, the saying. funniest part is that they say, well, what's your favorite food? And he says to Italian, oh, Tex-Mex. You know, it's, like, <laughs> um, it's a very, very interesting take on Marco Rubio, who I think right now looks like the guy to beat. Yeah, but Jonathan, to your point, what, and, and, and for the life of me, um, and I have to say, I, I've, I've been fortunate because, uh, as you pointed out, I, I do work at Fox News, and so I've had the opportunity to interview a lot of these um, a lot of these candidates, ironically enough, Chris Christie, the show that I do, for whatever reason, I was not on the show the day that he was on. Um, <laughs> I'll let you figure out why that was. But, um, but so you sort of have a chance to sit and talk to a lot of them, and a lot of them, uh, it's interesting, off the air are, are, are much more impressive than you would think they are on the air because they're not as filtered, obviously. The one thing that nobody ever was able to explain to me, I see the rationale for Marco Rubio. I see the rationale for Ted Cruz in the Republican primary. I see the rationale for all, uh, many of these people. I see the rationale for John Kasich. He's had, by Republican standards, a good tenure in Ohio. I don't understand the rationale for Chris Christie. New Jersey's a mess, fiscally. That's what we're saying. He's got right. He's got, and, but uh, to your point, he's having a moment. Uh, what moment is he having? What's the rationale? Why nominate Chris Christie? He's had a horrible tenure in New Jersey. He's had an absolutely horrible ethical record. Uh, you've got three people in his administration or appointees of his. Um, one pled guilty, two are under indictment, and who knows what's going to happen, as Gail pointed out, with uh, United. Uh, he is not in lockstep with the Republican base um, because he's flip-flopped on too many of these issues, all of which I pointed out. 
He comes from New Jersey, which is not necessarily a demographically important state. Uh, so what exactly is the rationale, if you're a Republican nominee, for nominating Chris Christie? I don't see one. I see the rationale for most of these other people. I do not see the rationale for him. Entertainment. Entertainment for, okay. Yeah. There, we have Donald, a, but we have Donald Trump for that, Governor. Yeah, we yeah. don't need him. That's the yeah. I think Republicans feel yeah. generally disenfranchised. Right. And I think we are right now tending to go for the candidate who is you know, the most outspoken and the most colorful because we're, you know, yeah. we need a mm -hmm. comeback. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's a hunger in the national media, especially, to always sort of, the, the horse race needs to move a little, someone yeah. needs to be the man of the moment, there needs to be this narrative. And there's always, national reporters love Christie and they want him to do well. That's you see it in their tweets, even when he's polling at 1%, they're like, oh, Christie's laying the you know foundations for something here. <laughs> uh, and, and I think what was telling for me personally, as someone who you know covered the governor's race in 2009, who saw all these stories pop up about Christie, is in that second Game Change book, when they were talking about Mitt Romney's uh, vice presidential vetting process. And I think some anonymous Romney advisor said, he couldn't get reelected in his own state when we were done with him. But they, they brought up all these stories that we all knew in New Jersey, because we all remembered them. But they hadn't been aired nationally. And Mitt Romney's people felt that these um, had, you know, were essentially irreparably damaged him as a, as a vice presidential nominee. And once again, even though those were in those books, those stories aren't on the public consciousness. Exactly and that was, right. that was before we have um, you know, a, a, a record right now in governance of New Jersey, which in 2012 when he was being, in 2011 when he was being recruited to run in 2012, looked very strong and has since really come apart in the last couple years. So, so ultimately, I mean, I really think that the talk about him, he's excellent at retail politics. He's extremely talented politically. But the talk in the national media about him and a comeback so far, even though now it's bolstered by some full numbers, but still this is mainly based on style over substance. And, and it's just going to take, you know, a, a Republican candidates targeting him in the primary to bring some of these things up to highlight some of his inconsistencies on the trail, some of his very, very recent uh, quote unquote flip flops uh, to really uh, you know, set the narrative back a bit. It is true, though, as Ruth pointed out, he's a great storyteller, and Garrison Keillor is stepping down as that host of Prairie Home Companion, so there, there is another opening there. Uh, Pastor, for to consider. Comments? Yeah. Hi, uh, Jerry Pomper. Uh, I want to remind the panel about the success of uh, President uh, Herman Cain uh, <laughs> four years ago and President Michelle Bachman uh, four years ago and President uh, Newt Gingrich. There's much too much emphasis on these small changes in the horse race, which is going to change and become a different horse race altogether somewhere. It's impossible for me to imagine, along with Julie, that the Republicans would nominate a candidate who is at 35% in his own state, uh, which is a state they're not going to carry against any conceivable uh, Democratic candidate other than uh, uh, O'Malley. Uh, so um, I, I think you ought to be calm about this. And the question, finally, I'm coming to, is assuming the Democrats are going to carry New Jersey, regardless of who the nominees are, even more likely if Christie is the Republican nominee. Uh, but what are the implications of that for other states? Uh, Ohio is a state somewhat like uh, New Jersey, uh, in this case, it's and so on. Um, and there are other really critical states. Is there any implications in what's happening in New Jersey, and particularly to Christie and the Republican Party, for the presidential election more generally? Well, Chris, you know, the raison d'etre of Christie's campaign is he was able to win in a blue state. He was reelected in a blue state. And you know, not putting his record aside, that's, what, that's the rationale of his campaign. I can reach out to the Democrats. I can reach out to moderates. I can reach out to independents. Kasich's making the same argument in Ohio. Uh, but you know, talk about industrial states, talk about Ohio. No Republican has ever been elected president of the United States without winning Ohio. So that's another rationale, because you've got a, another industrial state governor who might be able to appeal to those voters. As for the polls, yeah, obviously they don't mean much. I mean, I mentioned President Rudy Giuliani earlier in this discussion, but it does give you a, a snapshot of what's going on now. It gives you a snapshot of what the electorate is thinking. I mean, nobody thought in June that Donald Trump into 
November would be the front runner in Republican polls and Ben Carson would be second. And so it tells you there's a huge outrage mm -hmm. on the Republican Party. People feel disenfranchised, as Gail said earlier. People are mad, you know, they feel, it's like network. I'm mad as hell, I'm not gonna take it anymore. <laughs> and they're showing, they're showing it now. And the Ted Cruz's and the Marco Rubio's, both elected with Tea Party support, see this out there, and those are people they can try to harness, especially if Trump or Carson falter. I think what's really interesting, um, personally as well as professionally, is uh, the Republican rebuke of Jeb Bush. And I think, as I said to somebody very close to Governor Bush, the problem wasn't Bush, the problem's Jeb. And I think he's coming across, you know, Trump said it, low energy. You know, one of Trump's gifts is he, he, he pricks you right where he can get you. And in that case, I think he was dead on. And, and secondly, I think is um, Friday's announcement that, that billionaire Paul Singer is going to support Marco Rubio, I think is a huge uh, boost for his campaign. And thirdly, I would say, since today is the official beginning of the presidential season that we thought would never happen, I'd be shocked if John Kasich was not on that ticket somewhere hmm. just because of Ohio. Hmm. I don't think he's the top guy because I don't think he's appealing enough, but I think he's on that ticket. That's interesting. Yeah. And he won't have to defend having marijuana in Ohio if he is. You've said before that uh, Chris, Chris, yeah. uh, John from Hillsborough. Okay, so you've said before that Chris Christie was harmed greatly by the Bridgegate and Sandy issues. Would you say that his national ambitions have been a greater impact than that to his uh, performance in the state, just that he hasn't been in the state for a large amount of the time? Yes, yeah, they have. Um, I, I, it's been clearly reflected that the more and more time he spends out of the state, New Jerseyans feel like he's not doing his job here. The more right he goes, the more uh, that it also factors in that he's taking more conservative positions that are antithetical to um, the majority of people here. I don't know but anybody who even defends him anymore. Mm -hmm. Do you? Um, John Bramnick. Well, yeah, John Bramnick is uh, his, you know, uh, a, a big ally of his. Really, his most loyal supporter. Uh, yeah. But um, no, definitely, the, 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 his drop in the polls has, you know, it goes it, right with. The amount of time he's spending out of state, absolutely, and it's more than it, it, the ideological stuff factors in, but it's more that New Jerseyans just don't feel like he's doing his job. But let me also say, go back to what Gail talked about with Jeb Bush, and I think this is sort of the problem for Jeb, and it translates to your question about Christie. Um, what voters seem to want, uh, not seeing actually, this has been borne out. What voters want is genuine, a genuine sense of conviction, right? Jeb's fifth reinvention. This is my new Jeb Bush for the fifth time, and this is not being critical of, well, I am being critical of him, but not, but, but not for partisan reasons. You know, people want to know who you are. The reason Trump is so appealing is he is what he is. I mean, you know, you see what you get. Um, same thing with Carson. He may be low energy too, but he, that's who he is. Jeb is trying to reinvent himself for the fifth time. Same with Christie. People loved Christie when they thought he was a straight talking guy, and then when it turned out to be not the case, because he's flip flopped on so many of these issues and people finally caught on to it, all of a sudden it became apparent to voters that this guy was not the genuine guy that they wanted. Um, and so it ties back to the problems Jeb, I think, is facing. Whereas his brother, you know, Jeb was always supposed to be the smart one. Uh, but his brother was charismatic. His brother was who he, who he was. I mean, you kind of understood who Je George Bush was, um, whether you liked him or disliked him. Same thing with Carson, same thing with Trump. Um, Christie, I think, suffers from that partially. Jeb, I think, suffers from that I could, tremendously. I, you and I don't often agree on things, but yeah. I think that's, Listen, I'm hosting a Jeb Bush fundraiser next month. How'd you like to be me? I mean, <laughs> I mean it's, it's very, very difficult. Now, by the way, I think he's a fine person, and I think sure he'd he make a terrific president, and I think he's, he's seasoned and smart and all those good things, but, I mean, he's just getting eaten alive in these, these debates, and people can say, well, just tell the donors that debates don't matter. I'm like, uh -huh. you tell them. <laughs> I mean, that, it, it's very, very difficult. Money's driving this race. And these <laughs> debates are driving this race. And can I just so. tell you from a, um, remember that Seinfeld episode? Did you guys all watch Seinfeld? Did everybody here watch Seinfeld? Remember when Tim Watley converts to Judaism and starts telling really offensive Jewish jokes? And Jerry Seinfeld goes and talks to the priest and, he, and the priest says, are you offended as a Jew? And he says, no, I'm offended as a comedian. So, <laughs> so I'm not offended as a Democrat. I'm offended as somebody who preps people for debates. 
how was he not ready for that Marco Rubio retort? Yeah. What was that? That's complete abdication of any kind of debate prep. It was unbelievable. Because, uh, and this is, uh, they brought yeah. what they thought were their top tier donors in early June um, to the Bush compound in Kenny Bunkport. I'd been packed since March. I was so excited. <laughs> so we got up there and they had these meetings and they showed us the polls and they showed us the new ads. And then Jeb came in and said, I can only spend 20 minutes with you because I'm working, I, I'm debate prepping. I'm like, really? Four months? You couldn't get it together? Tell him to call me. I'll help him out. This is unbelievable. Because I think he's he's a little like my husband in that he cannot answer a question in a sound bite. But Gailey, I have, I have prepped your husband, and at one point we got him to the point where he was able to answer in a sound bite. I know, but he's backsliding again. <laughs> well, he needs another, be, he needs another be, joke. Before, well. before we started this morning, when I greeted Gail when she got here, I said that her husband looked good on TV last night, and I had a moment of thinking about maybe he should run for governor. And first she said, over my dead body. And then she said, but I could be first lady. <laughs> <laughs> and still be here. Right. <laughs> no, but I think that it, it is a shame that people who are like Governor Florio, policy people who can't answer things in the soundbite, are, are inconsequential, really, to this race. And I think that's why, that's why ultimately Jeb is reinventing himself for the fifth time, which just perpetuates the whole myth that he's not being genuine. Right. And I think that's, that's very sad. But I, um, you want to come to my fundraiser? <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty desperate. I'm unfortunately so, precluded. Let's take one more question and then we can call. I'm Cole Kleitsch, Gladstone, New Jersey, Somerset County, uh, where last night a, an incumbent who ran as a Republican ran as an independent and defeated a challenging Republican. There's 200 people, or 2,000 in, this, in the town. Um, before my question, I wanted to say to the League of Women Voters, would you guys please get back into the debate business? We would really appreciate that. <laughs> um, can you look at the national trends that the roles of the parties seems to be shifting very, very quickly? far quickly, more quickly in my opinion, than the parties have the capacity to adjust to. Could be media technologies, could be a lot of different things, demographics. Could you sort of prognosticate, not that you all do that much, right, um, as to how this is gonna look into 2016, and in particular to the big party the Republicans are gonna throw up on that great lake up there in Ohio. What does it look like for the Republican convention? Um, I, I personally think Donald Trump wants to stay in this race long enough to get the keynote address the Republican convention, so let's start with the, with the premise that it's gonna be a complete cluster, if that's the case for the Republican. <laughs> um, look, Citizens United did a bunch of damaging things, but the one damaging thing it did more than anything else is it allowed one or two really rich guys to supplant the party structure. Now, you may think the party structures were establishment and they were bad for everybody, and, and you know, the Jeb Bushes of the world would have been helped by them, and if you're an insurgent, you might not think that's a good idea. On the other hand, the notion that a Paul Singer, for example, um, or a Koch brothers, or any of these people on the Democratic side, we have them as well, the Tom Steyers, are able to dictate, or George Soros, are able to dictate pretty much policy and, pretty, and, and the agenda of, of any particular candidate, to me, is a troubling notion. Um, because what it essentially does is, is it consolidates power in the hands of the very few to the detriment of the rest of us. Um, McCain-Feingold was flawed legislation, but it was still better than what we have today, which is just essentially getting abdicating any party responsibility. I mentioned Ryan's Priebus from the RNC earlier. I'd say the same thing about Debbie Wasserman Schultz. I think she's been a disaster as the Democratic um, National Committee chairwoman, but at the same time, nobody cares enough about the post to replace her. I mean, that tells you everything you need to know about the role of the party at this point. Um, Ryan's Priebus is doing the best he can do but if you see this whole debate cycle and this whole structure about arguing about debates, um, he's going to CNBC for a debate that I thought wasn't that unfair. I mean, they just didn't like the questions that were asked, but nevertheless, um, it wasn't so bad. And so you've got the parties are completely being shunted and relegated to secondary status. Um, Power is being consolidated in the hands of the very, very wealthy. And um, you've got the response to that, the insurgency part of that, you see that with the um, antipathy towards Hillary on the Democratic side, um, because she's establishment, quote unquote. Um, you've seen Bernie Sanders, who's the most improbable candidate in the world, but still doing fairly well. 
And on the Republican side, you see Donald Trump, who the last time I checked lived in a huge penthouse on Fifth Avenue and, and oh, has a lot of money, but somehow has become anti-establishment. Um, <laughs> uh, all of a sudden becoming the front runner, and, and Ben Carson, who says all sorts of wacky things about guns and the Holocaust and, and, and getting rid of Medicare, also becoming the front runner. Um, so that, I think, is, is the very long answer to your question, which is that parties have lost complete control, more on the Republican side, but the Democratic side is coming too, have lost complete control over the future of the presidential race, at least in 2016. Convention, listen, if you, you, you're going to have to give Trump or Carson or one of these people, you're going to have to give them the keynote, I think. I, I don't think they have a choice if they win enough delegates. Um, I don't think Trump's going to stay in it to win it. I think he's going to stay in it long enough to be able to find a graceful way out. But he'll control enough delegates where he's going to demand a piece of flesh, a pound of flesh, and that's the best pound of flesh he could demand. And then, like Pat Buchanan did, if you remember, back in 92, could you imagine what that's going to be like? It's going to be amazing. It's going to you know, get... Get the popcorn ready. We're all going to have a great time in Ohio watching this stuff. Um, yeah, I'm going to take a question. Thank you. Um, Nick Polito, Rutgers University. So turning to the Democratic Party nationally, it seems at least to me that like the core of the party is really aging at this point. If you, like, regardless of whether Clinton or, or Bernie wins, um, you know, Clinton, Bernie, Biden, all really old. Um, so, Biden's not but, but, but who, but no, who's, I know. But I mean, I know standing? Biden's done. But yeah, 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 no, just in terms of no, you're right. Just in terms of like the structure of the party and like right. the leadership of the party is they're all like going to in in a in a few years like going to be, retire. Um, so, so in terms of Cory Booker, um, he seems to be like a rising star. Uh, in, in democratic politics, and he's fairly young. So do you see him as being like a leading face of the Democratic, democratic Party going into the future and rising into a really prominent no role nationally once these other, um, I guess, stars currently kind of step aside? Well, hopefully one of them's going to step aside after eight years in the White House. But, um, <laughs> um, well, hold on a second. I, I think you're, you're on to something, though, because I think... I think if the Republicans are smart, and, and there are some, uh, I think they are going to pick somebody who's young and vibrant, because that's going to make candidate Hillary Clinton look really timed dated, I think. Um, and, and before you answer on Corey, uh, I love Corey. He's a friend of our families. But you know what? If he's got a bit of a Christie problem, because if you look at his record in Newark, it doesn't look so good. I think for him, though, is will be more, by the time that happens, will be much more distant from his record in Newark than, than Christie is as, as governor. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Well, the Republicans were, had, in 2010, again, Ed Gillespie, who I mentioned earlier, they had a, a effort to try to really take over state legislatures and control redistricting and state houses. And they have a huge farm team in the states that the Democrats didn't do. And now the Democrats are trying to catch up, but you have that Republican farm team of governors of state Senate majority leaders who are the farm team. The Democrats have had the same people in hand. Uh, Chris Van Hollen, who's my congressman, a young guy who's now running for the st Senate of, in Maryland, he was in line to be speaker. He's you know, 30, 40 years younger than Nancy Pelosi, but she's not going anywhere. Steny Hoyer's not going anywhere. He's now going to go to the Senate. So you've got some generation of people who are out there. The uh, Castro brothers, uh, one of whom I would think would be a good vice presidential choice for Hillary Clinton if she gets the nomination. Uh, and you'll have this next generation. Republicans got to it sooner. Uh, you know, 2006, a lot of uh, Republicans lost 2008, and they were able to get the new generation out soon. The Democrats will be their turn, but they're a little bit behind for now. But yeah, Cory Booker will be a star. He already is a star in Washington. He gets a lot of attention. Uh, there'll be other people coming out as well. And you'll see a, another people, and, you know, Bernie Benefit, Point to benefit of my job is I get to cover Cory Book as his hometown a newspaper, so it'll be interesting to see what happens with him. Um, you raise a really good point, though, which is I think Democrats have been abysmal in, in creating a farm team. You have, I, I happen to be friends with the head of GOPAC, which is the Republican um, arm trying to get elect, people elected in the legislative level. They're on this 24 7. They have an entire organization. We have something called the DLCC, which is um, Democratic Leadership Campaign Committee, which is. Um, abysmal. I mean, they don't do their job, and so you don't have much of a farm team. You're right. I mean, our um, 
I think it was Bill Clinton who said Democrats fall in love, Republicans fall in line. Um, we happen to fall in love with our candidates. So everybody was in love with Barack Obama. But what they forgot to do while being in love with Barack Obama is work on what Howard Dean did, which is the 50 state strategy, in order to build up parties all over the, st all over the country in all 50 states. Now everybody's in love with Hillary Clinton. Nobody's worried about building up, again, this 50 state strategy. Say what you will about Howard Dean, and I know he was a very controversial, um, very controversial chairman, but in my opinion, he did exactly what we should continue to do, which is build up parties at every level and every, in every state, and we have not done that. The Republicans have. Um, and it's going to come back and bite us, the Democratic Party, I think. It already has, but we'll continue to do that in the next decade or two if we don't get our, our act together. Yeah, and there's, uh, I just want to, I think there was an Onion article about Hillary Clinton, and the headline was, I am fun. Yeah, and that was a great article. The whole thing was her explain. Uh, it, it is sort of ironic in a way that, you know, the Democrats have this huge de demographic advantage right now and have uh, growing minority groups in their corners, but it's the Republicans who have the more, uh, you know, who have uh, two Hispanic candidates running and who have a more, like, sort of vibrant looking and younger field here. I just think that's an interesting uh, juxtaposition. I think the good news for, for students, particularly of, of any political persuasion, is there's lots of room for improvement and for, uh, for you to move in as, as the next generation and, uh, and make things better. Um, we're going to stop, and I want to thank you all for, for being here this morning. Thank you. Thank you for coming.